Jan Cavell, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. Excited. Yeah, I'm excited too. Uh, it's, it's always fun to talk with uh, guests from across the pond. Uh, you're joining us from the UK and feel free to share a little bit more about that um, when we get to that point. But uh, I do appreciate you taking the time. It's morning here in Utah. It's, it's evening there in the UK. Uh, today, we're going to be focusing our conversation on creating the right culture and building the right senior team to grow your business. So really taking a human capital perspective to business scaling and growth. And you have a lot of experience in this area, so I'm excited to have that conversation with you. As we get started, I wanted to share Jan's bio with everybody. Jan Cavell is an entrepreneur from the UK who has a few decades of running micro and small businesses behind her. She's very familiar with all the challenges that go with that, having started one from the kitchen table where her children were small um, and she was a single mother, to go on to build that into a multi-million dollar turnover business. Jan has put her entrepreneurial experiences together with her passion for writing together um, to write a book aimed at helping entrepreneurs to grow their businesses during the big leap of one to 10 million. The book is called Scale for Success and it now is out in the UK from Bloomsbury with early J July publication in the US and Australia. Jan, again, welcome to the podcast. It's a pleasure to have you. Is there anything else you would like to share by way of background or personal context before we launch into the conversation? I think just to say, you know, because um, I've had the experience of, of doing what I've done, I know how tough it is for businesses to get all this stuff right. You know, I made lots, lots of mistakes. I got some things right, made lots of errors. And, you know, I've talked to a lot of entrepreneurs I like you do, but I do it for my writing. And, uh, you know, I'm sure you find the same, you know, we learn so much from each other. And, you know, so I've collected a wealth of experience, which I'm, I'm very keen to share and hopefully be of service to your listeners. Wonderful. Well, thank you. And I, I encourage uh, listeners to, to check out your book. I, I'm sure you'll talk more about that as we go. Um, but a, a great uh, opportunity to learn and grow from someone who's um, seen, you know, seen it play out. And like you said, we all, we all do some things right. And we also make mistakes along the way. That's part of the iterative process of learning and growing. Um, but whenever someone can learn from, from someone else, so you don't repeat those mistakes, you know, that's probably better whenever possible. <laughs> so, so I think that's, <laughs> that's wonderful. Um, so let's start generally, and then we'll zoom in a little bit um, to talk about culture and senior teams. But talk a little bit about um, how teams can go right or go wrong as they start the process of trying to grow their business. I think this is a really interesting one because when you tend to start up a business, then maybe you or you and a, a few other people and you're all on the same page and you're all wildly excited and, you know, this is going to be the best startup ever and you all buy into the whole thing. But as, of course, you grow, you get other people who are not so engaged. They may not know you as well. They may not even like you as much. And, uh, you know, it becomes a very different thing. And it's very easy for leaders to add one or two people here, one or two people there, and expect to have this wonderful atmosphere that they did before with everybody bouncing around going, wowee, we're so lucky to be here. And it doesn't work like that. As you grow, you actually have to create a culture. And if you don't know that, uh, it's very, very easy to, for things to go very wrong. So I think the answer is it's uh, easy to have a good culture when you start up, hard to maintain it, and harder still to win it back if it goes wrong. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Winning it back when it goes wrong, that is really tough. And, and uh, if you get a group of people together, a culture will emerge. So the question is, do you want to be intentional about the type of culture um, that that exists within your workplace, or are you just going to let whatever emerge and, and then try to deal with it? And I think we know, by the way, I'm, I'm phrasing that question, which one's the better, <laughs> the, the, the better yeah, outcome? I think we, we do. I think it has to be intentional. 
but equally, I think it's really important to get to get a, a buy-in. You've got to also let people have autonomy. So it's it's a really tricky balance to manage of not overstepping the mark when it comes to creating a culture and inflicting your culture, but getting their feedback. And for example, I'm a great fan of crowd sharing values, all that sort of stuff. So people are totally engaged and a part of things. But on the other hand, to let things run riot is a very dangerous thing as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I like how you you explained, you know, that, that new startup phase versus once you start to scale and you bring more people on, it does change the dynamic. Uh, and, and it can be a very tricky thing. Uh, and especially given that most entrepreneurs and most um, new startups don't have people on the team that are particularly, you know, uh, steeped in organizational culture and leadership. Um, it's usually, you know, you got a new tech startup, you got some, some coding wizards and some people that have a really cool idea. They get together as a team and then they, they start to put out a product. And then before they know it, they're growing, they're scaling, and they don't know the first thing about um, people management and organizational leadership or organizational culture. And that's where you have that initial culture of excitement and energy and passion of that core founding team. And it starts to dissipate because you have all these new people coming on and the founding team doesn't know how to, to intentionally go about building their culture. And then all of a sudden you find yourself in, in chaos, like you said, uh, and winning it back is really, really hard. And I've seen many organizations um, that have tried to go from that, you know, that, that smaller business stage the startup stage, or even an established, say, family-run business that's just been for generations, it's been small, and then they decide they want to scale, they want to grow. Uh, I, I did work with, with one organization uh, about a decade ago um, that for two or three generations, they've been a small family-run business. And then about two years prior to me working with them, they decided, you know, they brought in investors, they decided they wanted to grow, and they went from about probably 25 employees to 50 to a hundred. And, and they got over the course of just a couple of years, they got up to about 2,500 employees. Now that kind of a transition that quickly is incredibly challenging and wow. lo and lo and behold, they didn't manage it very well. <laughs> and, and that's, that's where I came in. They brought me in to try to, to help with things. Um, those, those are the types of situations we we see over and over and over again. And they are, uh, avoidable if if we're intentional about it from the get-go. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. And and as you say, unfortunately, there are a lot of unexperienced or inexperienced rather business leaders, uh, as, as indeed I was when I started off, around, particularly through tech now. And yeah, that must be, I mean, the, the mere size of the scale you were talking about is just mind-boggling how anybody could go, even somebody experienced, I think, would, would struggle with that one as a founder. That's real, really, really fast growth. But uh, I mean, there, yeah, there are success stories like it, but, but it was really tough. But uh, it, it's interesting, you nailed that point, very similar to my own opinion. I mean, I tend to say 50, 15 people, it suddenly leaps, but I mean, it does depend on sector very much, um, you know, and, and that's the changeover, isn't it? That it just becomes an altogether different thing. Yeah, absolutely. So, so clearly organizational culture is important. It's one of those, um, things that people either get right or they get wrong pretty quick out the gate. And, and so you're going to start to realize that there's problems pretty quickly. Uh, and hopefully, again, we can be intentional, we can be purposeful uh, and deliberate about how we try to shape and mold, you know, the positive, safe culture, um, the empowering culture that we want within our organizations. Uh, we've also talked a little bit about how when you start to bring on new people and you start to scale. Before we get to talking about you know, just scaling with lots of employees generally, how about that, that expanding that founding team? So you start off maybe one person, or maybe you have a couple co-founders, but now you need to, you need to, to fill out the executive team. Uh, you need to bring in a chief people officer. You need to bring in, you know, uh, someone to, to focus on various functional areas of the business. Again, recognizing that probably the founders don't have those areas of expertise, they, at, at the beginning, they're wearing multiple hats. They're trying to do a little bit of everything. 
but they usually, you know, don't have the expertise, you know, maybe they are a marketer or maybe they are a salesperson, but they don't have, you know, the operations or the HR or the finance or whatever. So they start to put their team together and that's a really critical stage uh, because that's laying the foundation for the growth of the business. So what are some things that are important to keep in mind as you you're starting to build that core team? I think the first thing is, uh, and whoever you're looking for on that list you gave and at what level of responsibilities you're gonna give it to them, is never ever panic hire. You've got to think a long way in advance about these senior level vacancies. Who are you going to need? Not who you need now, who are you going to need? And take masses and masses of time, and I don't mean a couple of weeks, um, you know, months looking for absolute right person. If you have to bring them on board early and pay a couple of months extra, doesn't matter. But it, the last thing you want to do is find yourself in a position where you need, for example, a head of the talent or HR or whatever, um, and you need them right now because you simply cannot cope anymore. So you're going to take the best of a bad punch that walks in the door. That's going to be disaster. So that's my biggest warning of all, I think. Yeah, that, that's a really great tip. And, and frankly, that's probably an important principle for everyone to remember, whether you're small and scaling or you're in a, a large established organization. I see organizations making really boneheaded hiring decisions all the time. And, and in part, it's because there's this hyper competitive labor market. Now it's a little different this past year due to COVID and high unemployment rates. And, you know, there, it, this was a blip though. Um, you know, the econ world economies, the UK, US economies are gonna come booming back. And prior to the pandemic, um, unemployment rates were at about an all-time low in the U.S. I don't know how they were in the U.K. And so the fight for talent was was uh, real, and it, it was a difficult thing. You want to get a good person on your team, you know, you're going to have to go out and search and find them and pay them well and give them good benefits and have a great culture and all of those types of elements in order to attract and retain those good people. And that that environment, that climate is is going to return in my opinion. And so if that's the case, uh, it makes it even more important that you spend the time, you do your homework, you know what you need. And so you can go out and find that person. And you don't rush into a bad hire. Bad hires cost companies so much money, not just in terms of the recruiting and the hiring process and getting people up to speed, but in terms of, you know, downtime, lost productivity, but also in terms of the culture and the fit issues and the the morale yes. of, of your team right you bring in a bad person they can wreak havoc with a culture and with a highly functioning team you you put in you know someone who doesn't fit and it can completely disrupt what that fine finely tuned you know team was doing so you got to be very very thoughtful about that and don't just settle for you know like you said you know you you put out a, a posting um, you get not as many people as you'd hoped. You're not thrilled about any of them. You hire the best person. You know, that may not be the best option for you. And if you're proactive and strategic and looking long-term, you can be prepared for those kind of eventualities, um, having, having talent pipelines internally, for example, and, and other things in place so that you're not put behind between a, a rock and a hard place feeling like you just got to get anybody in the position so you can keep treading water, right? Because then, you know, that, that can cause all sorts of problems. Um, other thoughts then on how we would go about um, starting to build out that, that core executive team? Sure. I think also sort of briefly linked in with that previous point and, and then I'll happily move on. But uh, I think startups can be lazy about taking up references properly. And that's really important. And I also think that they underestimate the time it takes a senior person to embed into the company because you're expecting somebody at really senior level to do a bit of you really at that stage when, you, when you're when you growing. And that takes time. They really have to know the company. You can't expect, you know, you can expect somebody, you know, Joe Boggs or whoever's making the tea or whatever to come in and do that job from day one. But you cannot possibly expect somebody at really senior level 
to be able to do their job from day one. So you have to build in that runway as well. I think that's really important as part of it. Yeah, that, that runway, me, exactly. That runway yeah, is very important. And I've seen it so many times where the, the organization actually, they do know what they need. That And that's that's a big um, question mark because a lot of organizations don't even really know what they need before they start advertising for a position and then they hire someone. There, there's no way you're going to get good fit when you don't even know what you need in the first place. So let's just take as an assumption <laughs> that the organization knows what they need first. I've seen it many times where they know what they need. They go out, they, they are very patient. They do a very thorough um, search process. Uh, they make a really great hire, someone who's a really good fit, um, has the expertise, has the skills and capabilities. And then they just assume that everything's good. Like the person's hired, they're, they're onboarded and now everything's good. To your point, you need that runway and you're, you are undermining the ability of that new executive to come in and make an impact, uh, and positively affect yep. the organization if you're not providing that runway. And so a lot of times you'll, you'll hear about senior executives coming in and taking, you know, the first two or three months just for a listening tour where they can just go around and, and uh, better understand the divisions and the areas and the units and the teams and the people and, and just understand how it all interacts with each other. I would say at a minimum, you at least need a couple months for that. Um, and, and a lot of times it takes a lot longer than that. So, so think clearly about the runway and that requires, um, proactive strategic thinking, long-term thinking in advance. <coughs> I absolutely agree. And I think, you know, that sounds so expensive to most small companies, you know, to have somebody at what will seem vast cost, you know, doing seemingly nothing for a few months. I mean, just sounds mind boggling, but actually it's the only way you're ever going to give them a fair crack at it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, very good. Um, so we've talked a little bit about how teams can go right or wrong as they grow their business, how uh, we need to be careful and thoughtful and intentional, uh, deliberate about how we put in place, hopefully what is the right culture. And then we've talked a little bit about uh, forming the right senior team. Um, let's, let's now finish off where we can talk about how important it is to treat ourselves as a valuable resource uh, and have the right support team both in and out of the business to make sure that the organization's being successful. I think it's crucial and oddly enough, I th equally, I think in small, smaller size businesses and startups, it's something that people, business owners, wildly underestimate. You know, the default point quite often uh, you know, there are an awful lot of, uh, and this is sort of proven data, there's a lot of business leaders who suffer from anxiety or depression or low self-esteem. And, you know, so, and, and they care about their teams. They want to do right. But what they do is they put themselves last. You know, you go home. Don't worry about that. I'll do that. You know, oh, you're having a rough time at home. You have a day off. I'll take over. And they've, you know, they've heard this word open door policy, and they think that means 24 hours a day. All those things, you know, which means they will self-destruct in no time or other. Part of that transition scale-wise in size is for the leader to transition from being one of the jolly team who happens to be the person who started it into actually a leader. And to do that, they have to be putting themselves first. They have to look after themselves physically and mentally. They have to self-develop and allow time for that in training. And um, however they choose to do it, but, you know, be it business groups or podcasts or um, webinars or a mix of all of them or whatever. But they need to upscale. And as I say, most of all, they need to physically look after themselves and mentally look after themselves because they're, they're really going to put themselves through a ringer. It, it, in the book that you mentioned, uh, the chapter on leadership is an entrepreneur called, uh, who's helped me with it, was an entrepreneur called Rob Hamilton. Very, very successful. And he actually worked uh, school term times because, uh, you know, it was only by giving himself those holidays 
that he could restore himself enough to be a good enough leader. And goodness knows, so it appears to have massively worked because he had one incredibly successful business, which he's now sold. But, uh, but yeah, um, you know, it's, it's the strange transition of you are an asset and it's not an idea that everybody takes to. Yeah, so we do need to invest in ourselves as well as our people. And that can be a, a difficult thing to, to learn how to balance. I have to admit, uh, I was actually on an, another conversation uh, this morning with a colleague and we were talking about self-care and we were talking about the tendency that both of us have, the, this other individual and myself, you know, to think of it, you know, like we, I have a tendency to think of it as being selfish when I am taking time. Yes for my own mental health, my own physical, um, spiritual health. And it's not selfish. Now, if, if I only ever focus on myself, then yes, that's selfish. But if I'm putting a lot of time and energy into the business, I'm focusing on my people. I'm trying to empower them. I'm trying to engage them. I'm trying to support them. That's great. If I can't take care of myself, I'm going to burn out. I can't keep that up indefinitely. Um, and yep. th there will be a point where, where you flame out, like you referred to earlier. And so we have to make sure that we, we uh, recognize ourselves as a whole person. I, I often talk with leaders about making sure that they have, uh, you know, a, a framing and a philosophy of treating um, their people as uh, with dignity and respect and as complete human beings where they can bring their whole authentic, genuine self to the workplace. So that's important work to do. We, sometimes we have to retrain ourselves to think of our people that way. But you know what? What's even harder is a lot of times helping leaders to recognize that that applies to them as well. So if, if I'm trying to treat those around me um, like their whole human self, every component, all these different elements that are important, the social, the, the uh, spiritual, the physical, the mental, um, you know, their, their workplace empowerment and productivity. If I'm trying to focus on all those elements and help them to maximize their personal potential, I, I can't do that sustainably unless I'm also doing that work with myself. And so it's not selfish. We got to focus on it. And that will allow us to, to really create a, a great environment and have a really great team. I think of someone like Steve Jobs, for example. Now, Steve Jobs has a bit of a reputation. People talk about him sometimes being difficult to work with. He's incredibly passionate, um, an eccentric kind of a guy. Um, but I was, uh, I did an interview with um, a, a woman who was his uh, personal assistant back uh, maybe a decade and a half ago. Um, who happened to be a personal assistant of him at the time. And she, she said that, yes, he, he, he was intense. Uh, yes, you always had to be on when you were around him. You had to be focused. You had to, he, he ran a mile uh, a minute. And so you had to keep pace with him. That was hard. That was challenging. But she said he knew how to unplug. And he was very um, purposeful in his mindfulness practices, in his self-care, his, his um, emotional and physical health and all of these elements. And, you know, when you have a, a, an innovative genius like a Steve Jobs, you may just think, oh, he just, that just is natural. It just happens. Well, according to this personal assistant that he had for years, she said, no, uh, I mean, he had to, he had to learn how to do that for himself to make it more sustainable so he could continue uh, to lead a great organization. Um, and that's Steve Jobs. I mean, most of us aren't brilliant, innovative geniuses like him. So we probably need it even more than he did. Um, well, we just can't forget the importance of that. That's fascinating. I had heard that somewhere, but I've never heard it sort of confirmed from somebody near him as such. So that's, that's really interesting. And, and I think you're right. I think it is a matter of self-training to do it. You know, but it's, it's a really hard habit to break, isn't it? That, you know, put myself last. I'm being selfish if I don't really tough. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Jan, it has been a real pleasure talking with you. The time has flown by and we're, we're near the end of our time together today. But before we close, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, uh, find out more about your work, your business, and a little bit more about where they can find your book. And then give us the last word on the topic for today. Okay. Well, about me, you can find my book at Amazon and all good booksellers. 
But if you also want to go to my website, and because you feel I've given you some value today, you can leap on it now. And there's a free download of a chapter that you can try of the book. And if you enjoy it, then you, obviously it would be lovely if you bought it thereafter. There are also some articles to read of my opinions and knowledge and interviews with interesting entrepreneurs. So do go to that website. I'm sure it's in the links below, but just to give it to you again, it's jancavell.co.uk. And for a last thought of today, uh, prioritise culture and get rid of any possible rotten apple really, really fast. Excellent. Thank you, Jan. It has been a real pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, to get connected, find out more what Jan can do for you. Check out her book. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week.